Welcome to The Stone Wolves, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins. Performed by Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves is also available as a Kindle ebook from Amazon.com or as a full length audiobook from Audible.com. To find links for those items, go to scottsigler.com slash the stone wolves, one word. Hello, junkies! Holy crap. The gangster hardcover shipping is finally done. After years of work to bring this one to you, it is in the wild, and a real girl and I are kind of shell shocked that it is over. We are planning on taking a week off to chill and enjoy life. A has pulled double shifts of packing and shipping during the day, then checking addresses, responding to emails, printing labels during the night. So we're working about 16 hours a day through this last, I'd say, two weeks. So her goal, now that it's done, is to get some sleep, which is well-deserved. I'm going to relax as much as I can, but you know what? GFL Book 7, it ain't going to write itself. It ain't going to write itself. So I will be back on that shortly. If you pre-ordered a hardcover copy of GFL Book 6, The Gangster, you will be shipped a 24-inch by 36-inch full-color copy of the Sigler-verse map. Those should start shipping this week, this week being the week of October 3rd, 2021. They are being shipped by Scott E. Pond, Empty Set's in-house graphic designer and the creator of said map. Now, it might take the maps a bit of time to reach you. Do not panic. If you don't have your Sigliverse map by October 31st, 2021, that's Halloween, then email info at emptyset.com. But don't email us before that. These things take some time, and the U.S. Postal Service has been mysteriously slowed down again, so please be patient. That is all the news that is fit to print. Let me get you caught up on the story, and then I'm going to go take several naps, and they will be delicious. Previously on The Stone Wolves. In the first episode, we saw The Killer in all his violent glory, tearing through the enemy like a bullet through paper. Now, we see him 37 years later, with his glory days far behind him. The killer struggles to find his way and leave his past behind, but his past is not finished with him just yet. Chapter 2 the butthole of a butthole. 37 years later. Wilson 4 is about 20% larger than Earth. It is sparsely populated, however. Where Earth boasts over 18 billion sentients, Wilson 4's population is just over 4 billion. Which means that Wilson 4 has a lot of uninhabited space. The planet has eight continents. The continent of Panmore is the most densely populated, containing well over half of the planet's citizenry, as well as the city of Ruffland, home to the Ridgebacks of Dinolition. The continent of Naraza, on the other hand, is both the largest continent and the least populated. A sprawling place full of untouched frontier, small towns, and landowners of modest income who still own everything they can see from their homes. But Naraza is also host to more than a few megacorp complexes and to gangs that can operate with so much impunity they are basically fiefdoms controlling the lives of everyone based within their borders. Naraza is lawless, unless one counts the law of the jungle. That particular court system is very much alive and well in Naraza. Mayhem, terrorism, and blackmail are regular occurrences. The murder rate on the continent, when it can be measured at all, which isn't often, averages around 50 per day. The terrain of Naraza is an unlikely mashup of deserts, practically bottomless canyons, and impossibly tall rock spires. Unpredictable storms of veil, a luminescent dust-like mineral unique to Naraza, often sweep across the desert at night, drenching the dunes in a swirling, surreal glow. In microdoses, Veil is a natural hallucinogen. 
but woe awaits sentients who find themselves in the midst of a full-on bale storm. It's not uncommon to hear about populations of entire villages caught unawares by the glowing sandstorms murdering one another in the streets after a blissful, epic 15 minutes of tripping balls. Naraza is the butthole of Wilson 4. And if the butthole had a butthole of its own, that butthole would be the southeastern township of Riss, home of the desperate, the hunted, the soul-broken, the sentients who want to live free, the ones who want to hide from the rest of the universe. In Riss, those who actually have a few credits to spare spend them at the Careless Whisper Saloon. The saloon is not a place of good cheer. Killian Carbonaro sat at the bar, alone, content to simply stare at the shot of whiskey the one-armed, heavy G bartender had poured him a half hour ago. Killian dared not drink it. The liquid looked and smelled like motor oil. He placed a withered, trembling hand on the small metal case atop the scratched bar, a case he had brought with him. The case was the size of an old-timey briefcase, like the ones you saw Earth businessmen carry in ancient 2D movies. This case was a far bit tougher, though. The micro-alloy covering could probably survive a nuke blast. Its locking mechanism, built by the Big Death, the renowned centuries-old quith security firm, guaranteed that it could be opened exclusively by the sentient authorized to open it and by no one else. Killian was not its owner. He hadn't a clue what was inside. Here, at this crappy bar in this crappy place, a contact would bring a third of the job's pay and a lock code of some kind, allowing Killian to open the case. Killian would follow the instructions inside, which would lead to a final delivery and the collection of the final third of the full payment. This needed to go smoothly. He'd already spent the first third of the job's pay just getting here. If he didn't get the rest, he was broke, and he wouldn't be able to pay his crew. Killian squinted at the case. This thing hadn't been easy for him and his motley crew to acquire. There had been the usual bribes to the system police, a payment of very sensitive information to a half-crazed Aquas, and a breathless week in which the Bict F case was in the possession of Bartell Waterbugs kicker Eddie Jones. Jones used his GFL immunity to smuggle the case through Planetary Union Customs, taking it from the Planet Key, where the Bugs scored a first-round playoff upset over the Vic Vanguard, to the Jupiter Net Colony, where Killian's crew had taken possession of it. The water bugs had lost to the Jupiter Jacks. Killian had wanted, desperately, to stick around for the Galaxy Bowl between the Jacks and his favorite team, the Ionath Krakens, but the case had to be delivered. The Ionath Krakens. The team his son played for. The Galaxy Bowl was already over. Broadcast signals from the game's first quarter, carried on punch relay drones launched after that quarter finished, would soon arrive in the Wilson system followed by drones from the second, third, and fourth quarters, as well as another set from any post-game coverage. If this run finished up nice and neat, without any unexpected bunkery, Killian, Beans, Aya, and Zan would soon be back in the Oleron with cold beers and hot pizza, watching the game as if it were happening live. While the case had been in Jones's hand, it went untouched by custom agents of any species, especially Kretorakians. The client had been quite specific about that point. No tiny little bat prints on my case, one communication had read. Killian and his crew had taken the case aboard their ship, the Oleron. The trip from Jupiter Net Colony to Wilson 4 usually required a punch-out at Lopu Waypoint, then Wilson 6. Killian, however, had chosen to go wide from Lopu to the distant Newton Webb colony so he could bypass highly regulated Wilson 6 altogether and jump straight to the far less strict Wilson 4 system. It had seemed like a good idea at the time. Most bad ideas do. They docked the Oleron at a Gans Prime refueling station. There were, what, two dozen of those Gans truck stops spread around Newton's orbit? About as low-key as you can get but someone had found them there. That someone? The Ponsky sisters. Pirates 
for lack of a better word, although the Ponskys also operated in smuggling, narcotics, strong arm, protection, bribery, the sisters never let a good business opportunity go ignored. How they'd learned about the case, Killian didn't know. At the GAN station, heavies had come for the Ulrin, demanding the case. Beans, the Ulrin's engineer, had managed to put the heavies down without killing them, thankfully. But it wasn't just the heavies. The sisters had sent in actual attack craft, three of them disguised as light haulers but attack craft just the same, to stop the Ulrin from getting away. The haulers weren't the only ones with hidden weapons. Barely free from the docking berth, Killian and his crew found themselves in a ship-to-ship firefight, using the Ulrin's top- and bottom-mounted 30mm anti-aircraft batteries. They'd crippled one hauler and, sadly, destroyed another. The pilot of the third hauler got trigger-happy, started spraying and praying with high-ordinance rounds that missed the Ulrin and, instead, hit a nearby cargo ship. That explosion had spewed enough shrapnel and superplasma to light up another cargo ship, which lit up another, which wound up lighting up the whole goddamn refueling station. Killian and crew had barely made it out alive. Thanks to the genius of Zan, Killian's navigator, the Oleron was able to evade more sister ships as well as the Newton system police. Zan's tech was some black magic stuff. As dozens of vessels fled the flaming fueling station, the Oleron weaved in and out of them, switching through a dozen ship signatures Zan had preloaded for evasive action. The Oleron's primary role was smuggling. The Kretorakian Empire did not approve of smuggling. Hence, the need for multiple convincing ship IDs. Other smugglers utilized the same identity-hiding strategy, of course, but not at the level the Oleron could. Zan was one of a kind. Once away from the station, Aya went to work. The newest member of the Oleron crew, Aya was to comms what Zan was to navigation and ID tech. Aya had flooded the dark waves with disinformation about the GAN station incident. She made her work seem simple, yet she had powerful juju. The sisters were currently chasing a half-dozen ghost sightings of the Oleron, some in League space, some in Union space, and one all the way out in the Pyrrhus nation for good measure. Good luck with that one, Ponskis. The sisters wanted whatever was in the case. Killian didn't know what that was. Even if he'd wanted to open it, he couldn't, not without destroying what was inside. And if that happened, he didn't get paid. If he didn't get paid, his crew didn't get paid. Killian's fingers drummed a pattern on the case. His contact was almost an hour late. It made Killian twitchy to sit here so long. Four patrons in the bar, plus the one-armed bartender. None of them looked like much, but some of Killian's scars were lifelong reminders that when it came to dangerous people, looks weren't everything. He stared at his drink. Could it really taste as bad as it looked? Killian wanted booze. Lusted after it. Sometimes the Nazdor wasn't enough to control his anger. Sometimes he needed a little help from his buddy Al Key Hall. Screw it. He downed the shot. No, not motor oil. Motor oil tasted much better. Killian grimaced. All this for a stupid, shucking metal case, and for another third of a payoff that would barely cover the ever-increasing costs of this job. His combud crackled to life, providing a voice that only he could hear. Our contact has arrived, Zan said. Game time. So close to finishing this damn job and getting paid. Killian felt his mind slip into an all-too-familiar mode, much like one slips on a favorite decades-old leather jacket. The creaking, cracked comfort of it, the familiar musk of the hide, the intimate knowledge of its hidden pockets and what they contained, and he felt his senses peak. He had carefully cultivated a life that was largely boring. Moments like this, or, say, moments when converted cargo haulers were shooting at you and the fueling station blew up behind you, brought back a whiff of the bad old days. Without turning his head, 
Killian glanced left at the saloon's batwing doors. He resisted the urge to roll his eyes. The contact was 17, 18 at best. Might as well have had the word local tattooed on his forehead. There was no way the gangly backwater in the threadbare trench coat swaggering toward Killian had enough cash, or cachet, to be the owner of the Bict Eth case on the bar. Hells, the kid probably didn't even have the sense to know what a Bict Eth case was. Quit joking, Killian whispered. I never joke, Zan said. Not with you, anyway. That was true. Then get it together up there, Killian said, eyes flitting toward the pub's rafters. The sand must be messing with your optics. You've made a mistake. I do not make mistakes. Not anymore. This was also true. The bigger the mistake, perhaps, the bigger the lesson. And no one, ever, had learned a bigger lesson than Zan had. The human male has the right bio-reading, Zan said. Also, a subdermal chip pinging at the frequency our contacts gave us, and my scan says he is armed. Knife in a spring-loaded wrist holster. Killian gritted his teeth. He forced a smile as the youngster approached. Killian meant for his smile to appear warm, disarming, but it was hard to forget that Aya had said it made him look constipated. The kid stopped a foot away from Killian. He stared at the case. Yeah, he was a local all right. Only a native Nirazavi would wear a constellation of little metal spikes on his face. Nirazavi inject a ficonite spike in their skin for every year they've lived in the desert. The kid had obviously never left home. Killian tilted his head toward an open stool on his left. Have a seat. The youngster regarded the older man, then sneered. His teeth had an eerie, purplish-green tint to them, like Mother of Pearl. Not just a native, but a long-time bail user as well. He was probably buzzing right now. Huh, the kid said. I figured you'd be a real tough guy, not a gray-haired old fart. You look like something a spider bear shit out. Like the forced smile, Killian's hunched posture was also an affectation. He sat that way on purpose, to make himself look far smaller than he truly was. Yeah, I've had better days, Killian said. You've got me there. Killian absently thought about the Nazdor coursing through his own veins, medicine that dulled his emotions, reflexes, and senses. The drug was rare, illegal in most places. Not in the purest nation, though, where it was used to keep the more violent miners under control, keep them working. He'd been on the stuff for decades. Such containment had a price, of course. At just under seven feet tall, Killian typically loomed over most other sentients. But Nazdor diminished him. It made his dark skin look strangely sallow and withered. He appeared bone-tired, which, in truth, he was. Without the drug, he looked like someone going on 45. With it, more like 65. There were other side effects. Killian felt half asleep most days, a half second behind the rest of the world. This molasses life was his secret. To everyone else, he danced to the same beat they did, in perfect sync with his compatriots. But Killian had lived lifetimes being at least five seconds ahead of everyone else, not a half second behind. With or without the Nazdor, though, he could crush this cocksure backwater skull with one hand. But no need for that now. He was here to deal, not kill. Let's talk business. Killian patted the Big Death case resting on the bar. Me and mine went through a world of hurt to get this here. Give me our pay and the combination, or key, or whatever opens this thing. The kid shook his head. Ain't no pay, he said. You just push that case over to me, real slow. Then you walk out of here without any new holes in your body. Killian sighed. Turned out, there was bunkery afoot after all. The only way to enjoy the Galaxy Bowl as if it was live was to watch each quarter's broadcast as the signals came in. If this took too long, the final score would arrive, the results broadcast all over the place, and the game would be spoiled. If Spikeface 
made him miss the game? Killian had been through enough encounters like this one that he didn't need to ask questions, didn't need to second-guess his instincts. The kid was going rogue. Idiots did that. Young people did that. Idiots were almost always young because in this business, idiots rarely lived long. I'm going to give you a warning now, Killian said. A warning I'm sure you will ignore. I think that's a rule somewhere, maybe even a law. People like you don't listen to warnings. Just finish the job, kid. Give me my money and the combination. Even if you are able to take the case away from me, which is highly unlikely, the people who hired us both are going to find you. And then it's lights out. The kid sneered again. They don't know my planet like I do, old man. Killian groaned inside. This kid had probably never been off this continent. He didn't know anything about anything. I'm not giving you the case, Killian said, hearing the exhaustion in his own words. Zan's voice piped up in his ear. This human's heart rate has spiked. I expect aggressive action from him. I know that, Killian said. The kid frowned. You know what? Killian straightened his back. He looked down at the kid. The kid looked back with newly big eyes. I know that you should give me my shucking money, Killian said. The growl of yesteryear fighting past the Nazdor. The kid flicked his wrist. A ten-inch blade appeared with a corresponding twang of early spring. He didn't strike. He should have. I'm the one. Who makes the threats, the kid said. The four bar patrons calmly stood up and walked out, the bat wing doors flopping shut behind each of them in turn. Hey, the bartender said. He was suddenly holding a sawed-off shotgun in his one hand. This better not be a robbery, because it's been slow all week and what I got ain't worth your time. Spikeface glanced at the shotgun, then at the bartender. It ain't a robbery, one arm. Mind yours. The bartender shrugged, returned the shotgun to its hiding place beneath the bar. Killian wasn't all that surprised. If the fight didn't concern the bar itself, the bartender didn't want to take out the punk and draw some endless ring of fire. Easier to move a body and mop the floor than take on angry relatives or gang members. Spikeface sneered at Killian. If you don't think I'll slice you right here, you're dumber than you look. I leave with the case. The only question is if you walk out of here in your own power or you get carried out. Killian smiled, a genuine one this time. As far as tough guy lines went, Spike Base wasn't half bad. My job is to get this case open, Killian said. Tell me how to do that, and I'll go easy on you. The kid blinked, surprised. He looked at his knife, then back. He was supposed to be the one in charge, not this old man. The first whiff of the kid's fear. Killian felt a rush. The rush was familiar, but distant. Nasdor was like a thick sheet of rubber stretched across emotions. I ain't telling you shit, Spikeface waggled the knife. Now give me the case. Do you know how many sentients died so I could bring this here? Who gives a damn? Open it or else. Hi, one. This kid had no idea how the game worked. I can't open it, Killian said. That is why you're here, genius. The kid frowned. Oh, yeah. Well, just slide that case over here or you're for the sand. You're for the sand. Years ago, Killian had served with a guy from Wilson 4, Jim Perry. Crazy crop of blonde hair, stiff and sticking up like an overused paintbrush. Jim had loved to use that line before bar fights or combat runs. All you bastards are for the sand. Jim could back it up, too. Killian had seen him kill. If one of us winds up in the sand today, Killian said, it won't be the kid's blade sliced out. Killian leaned back and tried to block in the same motion, but misjudged. The metal tip caught his right palm, slicing through skin and muscle. The kid tried to follow up with a backhand stroke, 
but killing was far faster, grabbing the kid's head and smashing it into the bar. The kid's head bounced. He fell backward, stool tipping out from under him. One of his spikes remained embedded in the bar top, a little clump of blood-spotted pink flesh clinging to the flat base. As the kid tumbled back, Killian snatched the blade out of his hand. Instinct grabbing hold, Killian reversed the blade and was about to stab it through the kid's heart. The instantaneous reaction of a predator, the Nazdor, slowed him, made him pause just enough to realize what he was about to do. I'm not killing anymore. That's not who I am. Then, the deep voice of the bartender. Put that blade on the bar, real slow. Put your hands up and back away. Killian looked, found himself staring down the sawed-off double barrel. I thought you were minding your own. The heavy G nodded. I am. He's local. You ain't. I don't need his kin coming in and blaming me for his death. Now do what I told you. Once upon a time, Killian had been quick. So quick, he probably could have slid sideways faster than the one-armed bartender pulled the trigger. But that was a long time ago. He set the blade on the bar, raised his hands, took a step away from Spikeface, who was rolling to his hands and knees. Just take it easy, Killian said to the bartender. Relax. The bartender huffed. Do I look stressed? I see stuff like this every day. He lowered the shotgun, but only a little. In a place like this, that was as close to common courtesy as one got. In a blur, the kid reached up a hand, grabbed the case handle, and sprinted for the door. Killian sighed, but didn't lower his hands. Zan? I see him, Zan said. A buzzing sound. Zan's drone descended from its hiding place up in the rafters. Before the bar had even opened for business that afternoon, Zan had cut a hole in the peaked roof and hidden in the darkness. For any encounter, an eye in the sky was invaluable. Huh, the bartender said. Now that I don't see every day. Zan's drone was about as long as a baseball bat, the undercarriage sporting an array of mechanical arms. It resembled a misshapen, mismatched metallic dragonfly, save for one key detail. A children's teddy bear covered the drone's head, the brown furred toy held in place by a liberal wrapping of duct tape. Killian cringed at the sight of the stuffed animal. He'd asked Zan to stop doing that during ops, but, as with most things, Zan listened only to Zan. That bear is stupid, Killian said. Your mother is stupid, Zan replied through speaker film that ran the drone's length. Do not denigrate my attempts to make myself more approachable and endearing to less intelligent life forms, like yourself. Tell I.N. Beans to handle the kid. Already told them, she said. A plop, plop, plop sound. Killian looked at his hand, saw blood dripping from his sliced palm down to the bar's scuffed floor. He cut you, Zan said. Perhaps you are getting old. That got a rise out of Killian. You know damn well how he got me. If I wasn't on the Nazdor, I'd... The entire bar would probably be on fire, along with the surrounding buildings and everyone in them, Zan said. I will take a few stitches over that. Thank you kindly. Twelve stitches, probably. On Killian's lifetime scale of one to ten wounds, this barely registered a point five. He looked at the bartender. Can I borrow a towel? The bartender grabbed the towel dangling over his shoulder, threw it at Killian's face. Killian caught it. It was wet, with spilled alcohol, and who knew what else? Keep it, the bartender said. He nodded at Zan's bot. That mech made out of garbage or something? Killian shrugged. More or less. Schmeck, not mech, Zan said. It is a branding thing. The bartender jerked his thumb toward the door. Whatever. Time for both you to get the hell out. Killian wrapped the dirty towel around his cut, then walked to the bat wing doors, Zan's bot buzzing along beside him. Together, 
they headed out onto the nighttime streets of Riss. Once upon a time, when the Nazdor didn't dull his senses and his bloodlust, Killian would have seen that attack coming before the kid even began the strike. Strange, glowing lines revealed to Killian an array of coming threats, showed him where to strike, and a corresponding absolutely bizarre slowdown of time let him react faster than anyone around him. The dead sense, he'd called it. Sometimes it still came out, gave him faded warnings, but when it did, Killian was always on guard, because the dead sense was a part of another him, a him of the past, a him the Nazdor kept in check. Show me where the kid is, Killian said. Zan's Schmeck lowered to chest level. A panel on its back opened and a holo projector emerged. The projector flickered to life, beamed an image onto a cracked sidewalk shrouded in darkness, complete with the audio of the nighttime scene. Could be a street cam's view or something from the security system of a nearby business. The glowing hologram resembled surveillance footage shot from a high vantage point, revealing a section of the street not far from the saloon. The sand-scattered pavement was practically empty, which made Spike Face easy to spot. He was dashing away from the pub, Case clutched in his hand, his eyes looking back over his shoulder, watching to see if Killian was chasing him. If the kid didn't put his eyes forward and start looking where he was running, he was going to hit something. Which is exactly what he did. He ran right into Beans. The gangly youngster smashed into an eight-foot-tall, mismatched, mechanical, man-shaped thing with such force he bounced off and tumbled ass over tea kettle onto Main Street's cracked asphalt. The case skidded across the pavement, leaving a sand smear trail. Spike Face looked up, shook his stupefied head as if he were in a cartoon, and then opened his mouth to speak. He coughed up a mouthful of blood instead. A few mother-of-pearl teeth came out, with the red. Beans's inelegant makeshift mech, one of the unlikely contraptions of his own design that he called Schmex, raised an arm and made a comical motion as if it were brushing dust off the spot where the kid had crashed into its metal chest. The arm's pistons groaned and whined as the Schmeck adjusted the shoulder straps of the big canvas rucksack it carried on its back. Killian heard the engineer cackling inside the Schmeck's chest. What a dork, Bean said. Maximum dorkage. Yep, yep, yep. The kid managed to get to his feet. Knees wobbling, he tried to scream something at Bean's schmeck, but Killian only heard guttural mushmouth nonsense. He almost felt sorry for the poor shucker. Almost. Don't let him go, Killian said. We need him. The kid whirled to run away and stopped cold. About a dozen feet ahead of him stood Aya, the Oleron's comms expert. Barely over four feet tall, she hefted an orange, stubby air cannon in both arms. Killian could have wielded the weapon with one hand, but the thing was almost as big as she was. The gun's orange somehow looked more sinister than her rare, amethyst-colored skin. You shouldn't have cut my friend, Aya said. It's Habananana. The girl spoke in slang more often than not. Killian didn't understand most of it. Hapana was no in Swahili. The nana maybe added because it rhymed. The dry, short, loud clack of the gun firing. A blur of something moving faster than eye or camera could track. The kid cried out, dropped to the ground, small rubber balls bouncing around him and off the walls of the building behind him. As he lay there, moaning, a streak of blood across his forehead from the spike still embedded in the bar top, the rubber balls slowly rolled across the pavement toward Aya. They picked up steam, rolled faster. She knelt. The balls bounced up and into an open pouch on her hip, a pouch connected to the gun by a flexible tube that was the same diameter as the balls themselves. Beans had made her the weapon. Aya called it her tough luck gun. Killian insisted everyone's primary weapon be non-lethal. The tough luck gun qualified, but getting hit by a cloud of hard rubber balls certainly didn't look like fun. Beans reached down, grabbed the kid's foot, and dragged him to the sidewalk. The streets were empty, 
but that wouldn't stop some joyrider from racing a grav sled in the wee hours of the morning. Killian gave Zan's drone a curt nod. Let's catch up. The holostream switched off. A few stragglers, drunken humans, and stumbling drunk quith workers wandered the dark streets, but there wasn't much in the way of nightlife. Killian and Zan quickly caught up with Aya and Beans. Beans held the case handle in one big metal hand and had one big metal foot atop the bleeding kid's chest. Spikeface had given up the fight. He lay there, head on the pavement, staring up at the mismatched machine holding him in place. Hello again, old chum, Killian said. I'll need that code now. And our money. The kid groaned. I ain't got no money. The contact said your payment is in the case. Which was why the kid went rogue. Of course. Killian had seen enough humans afraid for their lives to know when one was telling the truth. Sure, it was the kid's choice to pull that blade, but if the kid had followed the client's instructions, the same instructions given to Killian, then this wouldn't have happened. He's lying, Aya said. He's got chitin to burn. Chitin, her slang for money. She slung her tough luck gun, knelt next to the man, and started searching his pockets. The growing frustration on her face showed that she didn't find what she was looking for. Or he already spent it, Zan said. Killian shook his head. Aya, let it go. Desert kid, this is boring me. My hand hurts. If you want to live through the night, just save us all some time and tell me how to open the damn case, all right? Spike Face closed his eyes, sighed. My blood, he said. I'm supposed to smear some of my blood on the handle. Killian took the case from Beans, set it on the pavement next to Spike Face. Killian then pressed his thumb on the hole in the kid's forehead. To the kid's credit, he didn't wince. Killian wiped his bloody thumb across the briefcase's handle. The handle snapped in half and then shot inside the case. Killian heard mechanical noises, gears whirling and winding, then the case's lid rose. Inside, black velvet. And in the center of the velvet, a small white data cube with the letters CC etched in the top in glowing red letters. CC, Aya said. What does that mean? Of course, she didn't know. Aya knew him only as Killian Peterson. The CC were the initials of his real name, Killian Carbonaro. He felt a chill spread in his chest. There were few sentients still alive who knew that name, and most of those who did wanted him dead. The cube flashed with light, displayed a message in the air. Open me. Scan it, he said. Zan's drone hummed. Done, she said. It is safe. The cube will not open itself, Skipper. Killian glanced up at the schmeck and at the preposterous teddy bear taped to its insectoid head. He didn't want to open the cube. Someone out there knew his past. Someone out there had set this whole thing up for him specifically. Open me. Killian sighed. I'm tired of all this, he said. The smuggling, the stealing, sentient shooting at us, the lies and the violence, the death that always seems to follow us along, no matter what we do. Not this time, Aya said. This one's still breathing. She tapped the barrel of her cannon against Spike Face's forehead. Tunk, tunk. Had she already forgotten the GAN station? How many sentients had died there? Was it 15 lives lost? 20? That eagerness on her amethyst-colored face, her burning desire to follow the adventure. Yes, she had forgotten the collateral damage, as only a 20-year-old could. If you want to walk away and retire, Zan's hovering schmeck said, I will retire with you. Of course, we will not have much to live on, considering that we are missing two-thirds of the pay for this job, and the ship's credit is maxed out. Everywhere. Retire on no money? Hard to believe that after all these years, all the runs, and all the jobs, 
that he was broke. Killian picked up the data cube and pressed his thumb against the device's ID sensor. It beeped. A new message winked on its display, a string of digits. Killian instantly understood them to be latitude and longitude coordinates, very likely a position somewhere here on Wilson 4. Interesting. The digits were replaced with another message. In the land of the blind, it said, the one-eyed woman is queen. He went cold. The world became the cube. The cube and the past he tried so hard to leave behind. Killian? Zan's voice. What is it? A moment ago, Zan had been his family. Just like that, in the blink of an eye, he felt distant from her. He had to keep her away, for her own safety. He had to keep them all away. Let the kid go, Killian said. The three of you get back to the ship. Wait for me there. Zan's Schmeck let out a short, violent, full-body buzz. Absolutely not, she said. You are not going to those coordinates alone. We are a crew, Killian. We stand by you. Comforting words. He'd had a family once. To keep them alive, he'd had to let them go. Zan and Beans were the closest thing he had to family now. And Aya, even though she was new, she'd already proven herself. Killian would ride through hell for any of them, and he had no doubt they would do the same for him. But some things he had to do on his own. This is old business, Killian said, from way before I knew any of you. He removed his tiny com bud from his ear and shut it off. The shielded, heavily encrypted device was beyond military grade, as good as the J-plant communicators he'd used back in the war. Expensive as hell. He carefully put the device in a pocket. I'm offline, he said. Don't follow me. He walked down the street. Zan's flying schmeck didn't follow. He heard her protests, but he wasn't listening. His mind wasn't there. Instead, his mind was 37 years in the past, seeing the world through red eyes, watching his gore-streaked hands ruthlessly take life after life after life. He'd been a man possessed, a man consumed by a mission to retrieve what had been taken from him. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed woman is queen. The one-eyed woman. He'd thought she was dead. And now she was here, on Wilson 4. Of course he would go to her. He had to. You have been listening to The Stone Wolves, a GFL novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins, performed by Scott Sigler. Follow Scott on Twitter and at Instagram, where he is at Scott Sigler, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2021 Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song Battle Cry by the band Super Weapon. <laughs>